In May of 2020, Garden Fresh Restaurants filed for bankruptcy. They were the owners of a chain of restaurants called Sioux Plantation, if you're from Southern California, and Sweet Tomatoes, if you're from anywhere else in the country. They had two different names, but they were the exact same place. Now, I'm guessing for most of you, that means absolutely nothing, but for many of you, this was a big deal. They had developed a small, but very dedicated following. Despite having only about 100 locations, over the past year, this has been one of my most requested videos. In fact, the idea for this video has been voted up to the first page of my website. My mom has been one of the people asking for this video because it was her favorite restaurant. I was able to obtain a screenshot from 2015 from an actual text message conversation between her and my dad discussing going there for her birthday. You could read that she was obviously excited to go there, but on another level, consider that she was so excited she took a screenshot of the conversation to preserve that memory. So there's your example of a dedicated follower. In case you're not familiar, let me explain at least what I think made them so special. They were mostly known for their extensive salad bar. I've never seen anything like it. I'm talking about as soon as you walk in the door, there was this double-sided 55-foot salad bar containing just about every vegetable and topping and dressing that you can imagine. Then once you've constructed your salad, you are open to the second, less organized serving area that they call a scatter bar. This one was filled with soups, bakery, pasta, and desserts. They had these pizza things and muffins and even some of the smallest, most adorable ice cream cones that you've ever seen. So I guess right away, to answer the question of why they were so successful in the first place, they provided a unique experience, a communal atmosphere, a wide variety, and were serving food that most of their customers perceived to be tasty, healthy, fresh, and affordable. They always wanted to keep their prices under that $10 mark, and I apologize if I made you want to visit this restaurant because you can't, it doesn't exist anymore. That bankruptcy was a chapter 7 bankruptcy, followed by a complete liquidation and closure of all their restaurants. It was pretty much the owners giving up, saying that they don't have the money to pay their debts, it wouldn't even be worth it to continue operating, so instead they'll just sell everything they own, use the money to pay off whatever they can, and that's the end of it. And the pandemic, of course, has been a huge factor in the decision, but I do want to point out that this was not the first time that they've had major issues. In this video, I want to focus on the rises and falls that they've experienced leading up to and including what looks to be their ultimate demise in 2020. It all started with a man named Dennis J in 1978. He was working in the restaurant industry as a bartender in San Diego when he decided to leave his position and use some of his ideas to open his own restaurant. He was well aware of the rising popularity of both health food and buffets at the time, so he combined the trends by teaming up with two of his friends to open a health food buffet named Sioux Plantation. That, as far as I know, was already fairly similar to the restaurant that we know. Four years later, he opened a second location, also in San Diego, and two years after that, the concept caught the attention of two businessmen named Michael Mack and Tony Brook. They were both working at a consulting firm in England at the time, but Brook's father was in San Diego. Evidently, his father happened to eat there, was so impressed with it that he told his son about it, who instantly saw it as a potential investment. After multiple trips to San Diego and months of negotiations, Dennis J and the other owners sold the two restaurants restaurant chain to Mac and Brooke in a deal where they gave up 95% ownership. So Dennis J is no longer significant to the restaurant at this point, but sadly, I should point out that it was reported that he died in a car accident in Germany at age 44 just seven years later. So at this point, Mac and Brooke were the two in charge, and right away they had big plans of expanding the chain to over 50 locations by 1990, as reported by the Los Angeles Times. By looking at their locations by year, you can easily see how things started to go crazy in the later part of the 1980s. Now, they didn't quite reach 50 by the end of the decade, but still 22, and honestly, even that was way too much. Because they were so focused on getting new locations open and increasing sales, they failed to address the cost end of things and the stability of the chain. Those new locations were being poorly managed because the managers were chosen too quickly. It caused unwanted differences between the restaurants, lower quality food, general untidiness, it was a mess. 
months. By 1990, they were losing money, and in need of some major changes. Tony Brook had left the company, and Michael Mack was now the one making all the decisions as their CEO, and today, even he will tell you that he was not the best person for that job. It was a dangerous combination of him having only a little bit of skill, but tremendous confidence. Despite having no experience in the restaurant industry, he insisted on doing everything on his own, ignoring the advice of everyone around him, which meant continuing with the expansion plan. The situation escalated in 1991, when the board of directors collectively decided to fire Mac from his CEO position. And that was especially tough for him, not only because it was the company that he had mostly built, but because his wife was eight months pregnant at the time, and his father was on that board of directors that fired him. It's unclear if he supported that decision, but still, that has to be tough. To turn things around, they brought in a new leader, John Bifone, who had recently made some positive changes over at the Bojangles fast food chain, and I have to say, he did turn things around. He started a new training program that led to better quality and overall management. Of course, he paused the expansion plans. They didn't open any new restaurants that year, but possibly the biggest change was introducing the name Sweet Tomatoes. I need to talk about the names for a minute because this is a messy naming situation. I don't know exactly where the name Sue Plantation comes from. I have to assume that Dennis J or someone around him came up with it as a combination of the words soup and plantation, expressing that they sell, well, soup and plants. It's clever enough, but <laughs> plantation. It is a word that is commonly associated with slavery, so I'm not the first to point out that it's probably not the best idea to have it in the name of your restaurant. Again, I'm assuming that was at least part of the motivation of adopting a second name. The first one was already recognized in Southern California, so changing it would have been a sacrifice, but as they expanded outside of it, first toward Arizona and Florida, I have to think that they used the opportunity to adapt a new one. Plus, Sweet Tomatoes, it's just a better name all around, isn't it? Even they admit that it better reflects the salad and vegetable part of their business, which is more front and center than the soup. By 1994, when they had gotten things back on the rails, the board actually reinstated a much humbler Michael Mack as CEO. And all of the accounts I've seen and all of the evidence show that he did a much better job this time. They became a public company in 1995 and used the proceeds to pay off some of their debts that they had accumulated and to open more locations. In the decade that followed, they just about tripled in size, from 33 restaurants to almost 100. They were increasing their sales each year and, unlike before, were very profitable each year as well. It was by far their biggest decade of growth and, really, they never grew too far beyond that. In 2005, they were taken off the stock market when they were bought by a private equity firm called Sun Capital Partners. And it was under their private ownership 11 years later when Garden Fresh filed for bankruptcy. The first time, this one was a Chapter 11 bankruptcy, where they found a new owner and continued operating. Honestly, the private ownership and the lack of public information from this point makes it difficult to find out exactly where things went bad, but there are a few different things to point to. Their CEO at the time, John Moorberg, blamed industry factors. Restaurants in general had been struggling and they were potentially a victim of that. Specifically, buffets had really been on the decline. An example of that would be the owner of Old Country Buffet and Hometown Buffet had filed for bankruptcy earlier that same year. You would expect that to impact their sales, which it did, but it probably wouldn't have been as much of an issue if their costs were more under control. They were dealing with higher labor costs from increases in minimum wage, and they got involved with these leaseback agreements, essentially selling their real estate and then renting it back from the person they sold it to. I don't want to speculate too much here, but their expenses were rising while their sales were falling, so logically their income was going down, and it became impractical for them to pay off their debts. That is when they filed for bankruptcy, and after doing it, they closed about 25 of their locations, and it was sold to one of their lenders. It was a private equity firm who then sold it that same year to yet another private equity firm. According to statements made by their CEO and other representatives, it does appear that the new owners were investing in the brand and seeing some evidence of another comeback. They said ever since they took over, they had more customers each year, their customer feedback was increasingly more positive, they were even investing to start reopening new locations again for the first time in many years. The company was definitely portraying a real sense of optimism going into 2020, and 
we all know what happened from there. In March, they were forced to shut down due to restrictions from the virus. Obviously, a buffet-style restaurant like this isn't the smartest place to visit during a pandemic. Earlier, I even identified a communal atmosphere as one of the reasons behind their success. Soon after, they concluded that they wouldn't be opening back up anytime soon. They said that they were still paying $1 million every week in the meantime, simply just to exist, so they decided to end it. We have to recognize that this was an unpredictable circumstance that affected them more than most, but they did put themselves in a high debt leverage situation, potentially to fund that turnaround. Maybe this was like when someone pushes you over when you're trying to stand up, because that transition is when you're at your most vulnerable. Again, without seeing the numbers, it's hard to say much for sure, but that's my speculation. Let me know in the comments, did you love Sweet Tomatoes as much as my mom did? As far as I'm concerned, she was their number one fan, but if you think you can challenge her, I'm willing to hear out your argument. Also, for any of these super fans, or really anyone who used to go there, what has changed? I mean, even within five years before the pandemic, they had filed for bankruptcy and had three different owners, potentially going down and back up, so as a customer, what has been your experience? Have they gotten better or worse? Or if you happen to be from San Diego and have been to one of those earlier Sioux Plantation locations, how have those evolved over the years? It's always sad to talk about something that doesn't exist anymore, so any memories or thoughts or anything else you have to say about it, leave them in the comments. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Thank you for watching.